Hello and welcome back. Um, so at the end of the last video, I really set up high expectations on this whole Hilbert thing and Hilbert's program. But I said, in order to really understand what he was doing, the first thing we need to do is understand formal logic and symbolic logic. It's kind of the same thing. Uh, and so in this video, before we get into Hilbert, uh, we're going to look at the inventor of formal logic, some of the stuff he did. And uh, this is the Hilbert's old sparring partner, Gottlob Frege. Um, also, it's kind of nice to look at this because, as I said, as mathematicians and philosophers went their separate ways, mathematicians got Hilbert, but the philosophers got Frege. So understanding the philosophy of math after that, uh, it's important to know Frege and what his ideas were. All right, so. Frege was a mathematician at the University of Vienna in Germany, and uh, he was a complex analyst, which is sort of, like I said, analyst is sort of like on the, 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 the calculus side of things, and complex meant he dealt with complex numbers. Um, and what he did, what I think the start of all this was, was I think he misjudged the current state of affairs among mathematicians. He saw all of this foundationalism and interest in rigor and philosophy and stuff as part of a, a general interest in, uh, philosophical interest in mathematics and the nature of the objects and stuff like that. Uh, so he decided he was going to ride that wave and come up with an explanation of what the natural numbers, zero, one, two, three, and so forth, really are. This is a question that is perfectly at home in this video series. We started with everything is number, then geometry, now manifold of intuition, and all of that stuff. And, and what the, the natural numbers really are is a very interesting uh, uh, question. However, the way I present to the story is that mathematicians got interested in this stuff because their calculus stopped, stopped working. And they were hoping that by looking at this and maybe the philosophers helping in that they could get the calculus to start working again. And then perhaps once the calculus started working again, they would probably lose interest, which I think is historically what happened. And mathematicians have never really had problems with zero, one, two, three, and so forth. Not like they had problems with infinitesimal calculus and multivariables. So, not really a lot of interest there. But that'll, that'll come up later. He will be very disappointed over this. But the philosophers, let me tell you, the philosophers really loved what he was doing because it addresses a lot of these questions we've been looking through in this video series. So, what did he do? Well, let's start with how he kind of came to his conclusions. What thought process brought him to the ideas that I'll be presenting to you? The thought process was this. Uh, on what does our knowledge of mathematical stuff ultimately rest? He thought that we could figure out what our knowledge of mathematical objects ultimately rested on by doing a sort of modified version of Descartes' radical doubt. We can see in what ways we can, in what ways, that's the, that's the modified, what ways we can doubt things, and that will tell us on what different things our knowledge rests. For example, what does our knowledge of the laws of physics rest on? Well, he said we can imagine a world in which the laws of physics were different. Um, just we can imagine, say, science fiction or fantasy movies, that kind of stuff. That's easy. Um, his example was imagine a world in which the drown someone drowning in a swamp can pull themselves out by their own top knot, by their own hair. <laughs> we can imagine that, which means that our knowledge of the laws of physics does not rest just within our ability to imagine, our context to imagine, our brain, but must rely on observing what actually happens. Okay. Now let's take a look at geometry. What does our knowledge of geometry rely on? Now he knew at the time that you can reason perfectly well in non-Euclidean geometry. You can doubt the fifth axiom and develop all of this hyperbolic geometry with weird statements like rectangles don't exist. But he said you can't imagine it. Now you might say, well, what about all the models of hyperbolic geometry, like the, the, the circle with the coordinate and such? Remember from the hilbert frege debates, Frege said, you can't just change the meaning of your words willy-nilly. The logical relations are about what we're thinking about when we use our words, not just the words themselves. You cannot change line to mean chord inside a circle or something like that. We cannot imagine uh, the failure of the parallel postulate concerning lines if we're using the word lines in our usual sense. We cannot imagine lines in the way we use the word and having that parallel postulate fail. So he said, you cannot imagine, really imagine non-Euclidean geometry. 
So what that means is that our knowledge of geometric truths must rely on the limits in nature and capacity of our imagination. Not in logic, because we can reason perfectly logically by denying the fifth postulate, but it's the scope of our imagination. And in that way, he agreed with Kant in saying that our knowledge of geometry ultimately lies in something in our head, our manifold intuition of space, three-dimensional space. And so that's where we trace our knowledge of geometry from there. But he said, we cannot think at all without being able to do arithmetic. We cannot think of Euclid's five axioms without being able to count them and say there are five of them. We cannot think of uh, uh, Hilbert's different categories of axioms in his system without mentally being able to add them up and come up with 20. If we were to deny our ability to do arithmetic, we would be de denying our ability to reason at all. And so therefore he concluded that arithmetic must really rely on not an intuition of time, but our just ability to think and logic itself. Because we cannot doubt arithmetic without doubting logic itself. What would this look like? I mean, what, what does arithmetic is really logic look like? Well, let's say I say I have two pencils. Now, it might sound like I'm talking about something called the number two, and we can come up with all of these questions about the nature of the number two. But Brega said that that's not really what's going on. My use of the number two in that sentence uh, is actually highly encoded uh, a more complicated logical form. When I say I have two pencils, what I'm really saying is there exists an X and there exists a Y. An X is a pencil I have and Y is a pencil I have. And X is not equal to Y. And if I wanna say I have exactly two pencils, I have to say, uh, and, I, and there is no other Z uh, that is a pencil that I own. And that we just use the word to in a sentence because it's so much easier than saying everything I just said right now. And so that's the real truth behind our use of number words. Uh, a law of logic is a law that guides our reasoning. For example, if we said that A implies B is true and we said that A is true, then we can conclude from that that B must be true as well. That's a law of logic. And Frege saw arithmetic rules like two plus one equals three as really being just really sophisticated logical laws like A implies B I just talked about on this really complex encoding of our use of number words. So there's no thing out there like that. It, it might seem that he's saying that numbers don't really exist, that uh, numbers aren't out there, but not quite. Let me explain why not. <clears throat> Remember the hilbert frege debate, again. Frege said that logical relationships happen not between just empty symbol strings, which Hilbert had to say if he wanted us to be able to reinterpret models and stuff. Not just between empty symbol strings, but between the thoughts behind what the symbol strings mean. That's really what kinds of things imply other things. And he said that these are not psychological entities, but they're really objective. You and I could have perhaps the same thought. You could have a thought. I could, we could say, oh, yeah, 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 you and I are thinking the same thing. So that thought must be something external to us. And long story short, numbers end up being kind of like these thought objects. The laws of logic uh, are described the properties of thought objects. And numbers are thought objects. And now arithmetic is just the laws of this particular brand of thought objects. So for him, he wanted to break out of Kant's psychologicalism out of our head and say we're now talking once again about an objective external world uh, with thought objects and that uh, this is what arithmetic is really about. All right. So our first thing where he talks about people pulling themselves out of the swamp by their hair, uh, talked about how uh, Frege came up with the idea that arithmetic was really logic. And now the second part was elaborating what does he mean by that. Frege wanted to prove he was right. Now, how could he go about proving that he was right? We could say that Euclid showed the mathematics at his time was really geometry because he started with some just geometric axioms and proved everything else, including arithmetic, using that geometry. We could say that that really illustrated that this arithmetic or whatever really was geometry. Everything was geometry. 
So Frege concluded that he can prove all of arithmetic is really logic. If he could start out with just some logical axioms, like I said earlier, that if A implies B is true and A is true, therefore you can conclude B is true. Axioms like that and a proper understanding of our use of number words. Again, for example, that I have two pencils really means there exists an X and there exists a Y and they're not equal and they're both pencils I have and I have no others and so forth. Then from that understanding and from those axioms, you can deduce all of arithmetic. That was the um, goal he set out for himself. Now, here's the thing though too. Let's think back to our experience with Euclid's geometry or Euclid's elements. Uh, over the two millennia people were working with it, remember people found a lot of axioms and things that he had assumed, gaps in his reasoning. Nobody's doubting he's a brilliant guy, but even a brilliant guy can make some gaps that it takes other people two millennium to discover. How does Frege know that even if he does this, that there aren't gaps in his reasoning as well? That a future generation won't say, oh, here's something Frege missed out on, and therefore numbers aren't really logical objects. <clears throat> now, I had said earlier that Frege was a working mathematician, right? Said he was a mathematician. Now, in my mind, working, in my experiences, being a working mathematician, working means you probably grade a lot of students' algebra homework. And when you're grading algebra homework, they've got their equations, and you go step by step, and you found, out oh, this is where they made the mistake. And they forgot the plus or minus in front of the square root sign, or they added two to the other side and accidentally multiplied, or whatever. Frege said, what if our reasoning in doing all of these proofs was just like that algebra homework, that our sentences were encoded and look like an equation, and our steps of reasoning were just like algebraic steps that someone can, a second person can easily look at and tell whether or not you made a mistake or whether or not your reasoning was tight. And this is what he did. He created what we call formal logic or symbolic logic, a system in which we can encode statements in our natural language, English or German or whatever, into this logic, which looks like an equation. And then our reasoning on it is just like algebraic manipulation of equations. So it's easy to see where the steps are, what, you know, check all of that. He created all that and uh, he did it. He started with his uh, axioms, his logical axioms, and he deduced arithmetic. So let's take a look first uh, what uh, his system looks like. So this is Frege's, if you will, algebraic logical system. All right, this is what it looks like. I've heard some people call it pinball logic because it looks kind of like a setup of a pinball machine where you can imagine the little ball, bling, 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 going down. You gotta flip the flippers and bounce it back up again. Uh, not that easy to read. It doesn't quite make sense. You might notice that this thing on the right-hand side at the bottom is cut off. Take my word for it. Showing you what's cut off will not make it any more clear. It's not the fact that, oh, I don't understand this because that bottom part was cut off. It's a very complicated system, hard to parse. So not only, I think, did uh, Frege misjudge uh, the state of affairs among mathematicians and why they were doing things. But I think this symbolism here also stopped people from paying much attention to what he was doing, except for, of course, Russell. All right, so does that settle the problem? One little issue. Frege published his works in two volumes. And while the second volume was at the printers, he received an unfortunate piece of fan mail from the philosopher in England, Bertrand Russell. Russell was this guy that said that uh, math is the subject in which we don't know what we're talking about nor whether what we're saying is true, he, that guy. And he wrote a piece of fan mail saying, oh, I love this, this is great, this is exactly what I'm looking for. He hated Kant's psychologicalism and he loved the objectivity that Frege was bringing back to mathematics and all of that stuff. One little thing though, uh, the axioms are inconsistent. Uh, Russell was able to deduce a contradiction from those axioms. So uh, Frege had the publisher put these labels in the front cover of all the second editions saying, yeah, you know, just in, in, in full uh, admittance here, um, this contradiction was found. Hope to be able to fix it quickly. Let you know when I do. He did not. Uh, so why are we still talking about this? Well, Russell, in what my advisor back in grad school in philosophy, uh, 
said was a historic act of chutzpah, uh, decided to just do Frege one better. He grabbed his old uh, math professor, Alfred North Whitehead, and the two of them started to get to work. And they created their own system, and they created their own axioms, and they were just going to do it consistently this time. They knew what caused the contradiction, what sort of thing was there, and they were going to do a new system that avoided that. And they did. And they put that out. Uh, as a little side note, their notation was a little cleaner. Uh, they borrowed it from an Italian mathematician by the name of Giuseppe Piano. Uh, something Piano is known for is uh, he thought, well, why does geometry have all the fun with this axiom system? He wanted to come up with an axiom system for arithmetic. So he developed axioms for arithmetic, and we call that system Piano Arithmetic. Um, and he also developed his own symbolism, which he loved. And here's a good story. He used this symbolism when he was lecturing in class, and the students hated it. They went and they complained. And he said, okay, listen, listen, listen. If, if you stop complaining and just let me use the symbolism and stop whining about it, I'll give everybody A's. And they didn't buy it. They said, nope, we need to know this stuff for our tests. You need to teach it to us. You can't use this anymore. So he was unable to use the symbolism in class. Now, Russell, however, found the symbolism a lot better than Frege's, which is not a very high bar to have to meet. And so he adopted Piano's uh, notational system for his book, which is called uh, the Principia Mathematica. So the Principia Mathematica is his and Whitehead's attempt to do what Frege had done in this new system. So let me show you. I also have a copy of what does this other notational system look like. Um, okay, go screen share. This is some work from the Principia Mathematica. Now, of course, this probably doesn't make much sense to you either, either, but at the very least, it is like lines of algebraic equations, right? All you need to know is kind of learn what these symbols mean, and then you're off to the races. You can start doing your deductions. Someone else can check your, cal check your uh, calculations and go for it. And that was all done. Hold on. Why am I unable to? There we go. All right. So, Frege, or not Frege, uh, 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 Russell and Whitehead were able to do this project, starting with some logical axioms. They were able to deduce arithmetic. And from their perspective, unlike uh, 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 Frege's, they thought that this would get you all of mathematics in general. Uh, arithmetic gets you numbers, numbers you can use to get the real number line. You put two real number lines at right angle to each other and you get the whole plane, and then you can get geometry from that way and so on and so forth. So they saw what they were doing is the foundations of all of mathematics. And as I said, uh, as of, I'm proud to admit, I'm happy to admit that as of 2020, no one's found a contradiction in it. But Let's just take a look at that statement. You know, all I can say is that as of 2020, no one's found a contradiction in it. We'd really like better than that. This brings us back to where that last video left off. Hilbert decided to take it on himself to figure out a way to actually prove one of these systems is consistent. And if you can prove it's consistent, you can then use it from then on, confident that you will not go wrong. I mean, or, or if you go wrong, it's your fault and not the system's fault, at least. This is what the next video is going to be. So in the next video, I'm going to outline what's called Hilbert's program and some result called Gödel's incompleteness theorem, and we'll see what that has to do with it. Now, uh, I mentioned my uh, philosophy advisor a bit earlier. He's a, a man by the name of Mick Detlison, uh, Michael Detlison. He goes by Mick, uh, and he's... Really great guy, really well respected in the field. He did very well by me and uh, passed away within the last year so recently. So I would like to do fine by him. And if this next video, Hilbert's program and Gödel's incompleteness theorem was his thing. And if I covered it in the same level of rigor and detail that I've been covering all these other topics and all these other videos, I would probably just say the standard story about what all happened, and uh, he would roll over in his grave. <laughs> and since he did so well by me, I would like to do well by him. So in the next video, I'm going to perhaps be cutting the baloney a little thinner than I usually do in these videos. If you don't know what that phrase means, don't worry. It's a good thing. Uh, everything I do that's really insightful and educative, 
uh, and uh, all that, you, you attribute that to Nick. That's what I got from him. All the star points where I do hand wavy stuff and get things wrong, it is not his fault. <laughs> Trust me. Then the video after that, I, I've entitled it summary on my list, but it's not really a summary between you and me. It's really more of a wrap party. I just want some sort of reward for you and for me for having gotten through this all. <laughs> so at the end of the next video, I'm going to invite you to treat yourself, bring some ice cream or a coffee drink or an adult beverage if you are of age uh, to the last video and I will do the same and we'll sit back and I'll talk about what kinds of things happened since Goodell's and Completeness Theorem. Uh, and talk about my experiences in graduate school in the 90s in mathematics and in philosophy, what kinds of things I saw, and uh, why I think learning all of this history and philosophy of mathematics is important for mathematicians. So that's, that's supposed to be the payoff. That's going to be the payoff for having gotten through all of these videos, and I really look forward to sharing that experience with you. Two more to go. Let's go. We can do this.